Hello, welcome to Projects, Topics, and Electronics. As promised in the previous video, I'm going to cover the PCB design for the NRF24L01 Plus dev board. So first, just to cover some of the components, in the center here is the heart of the board, that is the NRF24L01 Plus chip. To the left here, I have some screw terminals for hooking up the board to an external microcontroller. Up here is the 3.3 volt regulator, which is nice to have because then I do not have to run two separate supplies to this board since I have the power amplifier set up for 6 volts and the NRF24 chip takes 3.3 volts. On the right of the board is the power amplifier with a gain of approximately 20 decibels as explained in the previous video. And then at the end I have an edge mount RPSMA connector for attaching the antenna. And that's really about it for main components. The rest of the components on this board are mostly pulled from a few data sheet. All right. So now moving on to the actual RF layout tips. The first thing I want to note is that this is a two-layer board, meaning that the traces and components are routed and placed only on the front and back sides of the board. There are no internal layers in this design. Ideally, a four-layer design would probably be better, especially if you were going to embed a microcontroller or other digital circuitry on the same board. But a four-layer board adds extra costs, and I am externally wiring an Arduino to this board, so I decided to go with a two-layer design. Now, when designing a two-layer RF board, it is recommended that all components be mounted on one side of the board and the back side of the board be a solid ground plane. Also, as you can see on my top layer, I did not etch away all of the copper outside of the traces, but rather I left the surrounding copper and made it a ground plane as well. This not only helps to improve noise immunity, but it, also, but it actually is easier to manufacture since FR4 PCB etching is a subtractive process. Leaving most of the copper on the board just means that less material has to be removed by the board house. And then a side note here, there's also a cool PCB fabrication technique called thick film printing. There isn't a whole lot of use for this method in the DIY domain, but the process of thick film printing is actually opposite of your typical FR4 fabrication in that it is an additive process where the conductive traces, resistors, etc. are printed onto the board. Thick film printing is used mostly for applications that require high thermal conductivity or mechanical contact, like most potentiometers, for example. Anyways, getting back to the topic at hand, you may have noticed that I have vias all around the edge of the board that don't appear to be connected to any traces. This is because the vias exist only to tie the front and back side of the ground planes together. This technique is called via stitching and helps to ensure a solid contact between the two ground planes. Generally, you want to avoid having separate unconnected ground planes on a board, and you also want to make sure they are well connected. Without vias, the front and backside ground planes on the board would only be connected through the through-hole terminal right here. But that would be just one connection for these two entire planes. It is hard to know exactly what kind of effect this would have on the board without some pretty sophisticated simulation software, but following this practice should hopefully ensure optimal performance. Really, that's the main tip for the most part. In the last video, I pointed out page 62 of the NRF24 datasheet, which contains some more recommendations like how and where to place decoupling capacitors and keeping tracers as short as possible. I usually tend to follow the guidelines and datasheet pretty closely in my designs, since they are usually written by experts and engineers who design the chip. However, I did deviate from the recommendations when it came to package size. For the passive components, the NRF24 datasheet recommends 0402 size components, but I used 0603 size components instead. I can't see how the size would have a huge effect on board performance, and is, but it is much easier to manually place 0603 size components with a pair of tweezers as opposed to 0402. So that was my main motivation behind switching to a larger size component in this case. If you have never laid out a board before, or want to switch to KiCad but don't know how to use the software, I highly recommend you head over to Contextual Electronics page and go through their tutorials. I went through the tutorials myself when I was looking for a new design software, and they do an excellent job explaining how to use this program, as well as everything you need to know to order boards through Oshpark. I've been really pleased with KiCad for the few boards I've laid out in the environment, but just in case there's a few questions here, uh, these traces aren't really skinny, it's just the way it's zoomed here, and if I zoom in, then they look like a normal width, so... There's a few quirks to the software, but overall for it being free, it works extremely well. Anyways, that's about all the time I have for this video. 
I hope you maybe learned a thing or two today and found the topics informative. In the next video, I will show you how you construct these boards at home and some of the things to watch out for in that process. I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.